This spring is the outlet of Arkansas's longest cave. Fitton Cave has passages mapped at almost eight miles long. Its other name, Beauty Cave, reflects the amazing speleothelms found deep inside. These cave formations, and sedimentary deposits within the cave, allowed researchers to recently put together a really interesting story tying the cave's history into Ice Age glacial cycles. Ever since reading this paper, released online in August 2025, we've been excited about sharing its findings with our viewers. But first, we wanted to visit the cave's highly scenic setting within the rugged and remote Cecil Creek Basin, so we could help you appreciate its diverse and fascinating geologic context. Because this is a story of how surface processes could be affecting a cave system over a couple million years. So today on Ozark Outsider, we'll bring you along as we go on and off trail to explore the area's dramatic bluff lines, tumbling waterfalls, giant boulders, landslide scars, and diverse karst features, including springs, cave entrances, and deep sinkholes. This video will shed some light on the geology of this wonderful part of the Upper Buffalo River country, setting the stage for a follow-up video where we'll go deeper into the story of how erosion and deposition within Fitton Cave appear to be tied to Ice Age climate patterns. Cecil Creek lies in the southern Ozarks, within northwest Arkansas's Boston Mountains. This area is packed with interesting bedrock geology, at a regional and local scale. The creek's drainage basin forms a scenic and rugged landscape spanning over 1,100 feet in vertical relief. Only the lower portion is publicly accessible as part of the Buffalo National River, but there's plenty to explore here. The National Park Service refers to this area as Cecil Cove, so we'll follow their lead for clarity. The geologic sequence here consists of more or less flat-lying sedimentary rocks, descending from a distinct bluff-forming unit of Pennsylvanian Age sandstone, through a complex sequence of sandstone, siltstone, shale, and limestone, to a thick slope-forming shale unit, to a little more sandstone, and finally down to a thick Mississippian Age limestone that hosts most of the valley's karst features. Let's explore some highlights. At Hideout Hollow, a lovely waterfall flows across a thick resistant sandstone layer. This is part of the Pennsylvanian Age Bloyd Formation, some of the youngest bedrock in Cecil Cove. Getting down to the base of the falls is a little challenging, but it can be done, and the setting is spectacular. These sandstone bluffs are commonly undercut at their base, where it's easy to find well-preserved plant fossils in the overhangs. This sandstone acts as a caprock layer that forms prominent bluffs rimming the entire upper basin, and can also be seen at nearby McFerrin Point. In many places along that upper bluff line, giant boulders have broken off and worked their way down slope. For any given boulder, you might wonder, did that movement happen slowly or quickly? Recently or long ago? When will the next one crack off? Other resistant sandstone layers lower in the sequence also shape the terrain, as here in Broadwater Hollow, where a thin sandstone unit caps this narrow gorge otherwise cut into limestone. The upper rim of Cecil Cove is defined by a stair-like pattern of topographic benches descending into the valley. These are developed within that complex sequence of sediments we discussed earlier, with bluff lines defined by erosion-resistant units of sandstone and occasional limestone. A great way to explore this landscape pattern is along the Cecil Bench Trail, which follows an especially prominent bench for a while before descending into the valley. But there is a twist for those wanting to hike this trail or even drive the primary road down into the valley. Recently active slumps and landslides. The source of the problem in both cases is the presence of shale in this geologic sequence. Did you notice how Cecil Cove's landscape changes abruptly, partway down, from the rugged series of topographic benches to a much smoother, gentler slope? That's the influence of the Fayetteville Shale, a particularly thick unit of black shale with finely laminated layers. Shale tends to be less geologically stable than sandstone or limestone, and this stuff is quite capable of slumping and sliding, especially when wet. It's so erodible that it doesn't often appear in bedrock outcrops 
though you can find fragments along trails and creek beds. The best place to find bedrock exposures is in roadside cuts like this, near the top of the Fayetteville Shale. Farther down, there is evidence that shale slumping is creating ongoing challenges to road maintenance. Much of the landscape underlain by the Fayetteville Shale has an uneven terrain referred to as hummocky topography. This is hard to photograph on site, but it's a clear sign of past mass movements such as slumps or landslides. But shale also occurs higher in the stratigraphic sequence, as thinner beds between the erosion-resistant sandstone and limestone layers defining those topographic benches, and it's just as unstable there. You can find dramatic evidence of this about three-quarter mile along the Cecil Bench Trail, seen here looking southwest. In a 2019 image, this is just another forested hillside. But by this photo in 2022, a landslide centered in the shale has bulldozed trees and rearranged the landscape, wiping out the trail's original path. Notice this other smaller slide that also developed in the same time frame and from the same topographic bench. In this 2023 winter shot, both landslide scars are even more obvious. Other imagery shows that both developed in early 2020. This slide began high on the steep upper terrain of Cecil Cove and ran out right over the Cecil Bench Trail, leaving a tangled mass of trees and rubble that is somewhat challenging to negotiate though a rough social trail has emerged. One benefit of this slide is a rare tree-free vantage point out over the valley. We hiked this under reasonably dry conditions, but we'd be very cautious about interacting with unstable shale slopes like this during a wetter period, either by trail or road. Many slopes are littered with sandstone boulders that have fallen or slid from higher up. Presumably the presence of shale lubricated their journey, but the details of movement are lost to time and tiny tributary valleys are studded with boulders far bigger than today's hydrology could carry. What would we see if we could run a time lapse in these valleys for the past few million years? Shale may not offer solid support, but you can. We're grateful to viewers who've supported us financially via Ko-fi, link below, and for all those who like, comment, and subscribe. With your bedrock support, we can keep delving deeper into Ozark geology. Below the Fayetteville Shale lurks the star of the show, the cave-hosting limestone of the Boone Formation. This unit underlies the lowest parts of Cecil Cove and is the host rock for Fitton Cave and various other karst features within the valley. High on a steep slope along Broadwater Hollow, a tributary to Cecil Creek, there's an awe-inspiring sinkhole known as Devil's Den. Its bottom is all but out of sight, but you can clearly hear water running deep within. Then there's Mud Cave, which opens from a narrow crevice at ground level into a startlingly large chamber, though access rules for this ungated vault are unclear, so we didn't explore very far. Near the base of the tributary Bartlett Cove is this oddly tight meander bend with two parallel limbs. Each limb leads to a small cave entrance, implying that karst action, presumably along joints, contributed to the development of this particular stream pattern. The lower limb lines up intriguingly well with the Devil's Den sinkhole a quarter mile away up Broadwater Hollow. The sediments choking this passage are an early hint at the story of Fitton Cave. Rounding out our tour of major Cecil Cove karst features are two notable springs emerging from the Boone Formation. Van Dyke Spring forms this attractive pool along the valley's south side and is easily accessible by trail. But the real star is Fitton Spring, where this video began. This one emerges from a limestone bluff on the valley's north side, off trail, and features a really interesting multi-pronged entrance passage. Although dye tracing has linked the outflow from Fitton Spring back to Fitton Cave, humans haven't been able to make it through the connecting passages. A report from the Cave Research Foundation had this to say about the spring. Although we penetrated the spring 40 feet with our survey, the name assigned to it, Misery Hole, explains the final status until we can find some smaller cavers. Fitton Cave is a multi-level cave with passages running under this general area. There are two human usable entrances, both well off trail. Finding these requires some skill at orienteering, landscape interpretation, and research. Like most major Ozark cave entrances, both are gated to prevent unauthorized entry. 
Peering into one entrance, you can clearly hear a strong flow of water deeper within, even during the dry period of our visit. Although this opening is the larger of the two, it's traditionally less used by cavers because its passages are particularly difficult to navigate. This book memorably describes one stretch as a high passage which requires jumping 21 times from ledge to ledge across a chasm that reaches as much as 30 to 40 feet down to the water. The Fitton Cave entrance primarily used for cave exploration is much smaller and well hidden on a steep slope. When we finally found the gate, we wistfully wondered whether we'd ever have an opportunity to enter. If current policy persists, we suspect not. Traditionally, Fitton Cave's extraordinary length and beauty made it a popular destination for cavers, as testified by the presence of a dedicated cavers camp near the mouth of Cecil Cove. This historic building, the Revis Cabin, formerly housed cavers during regular efforts to map the cave. It's worth recognizing the decades of extensive mapping efforts coordinated by the Cave Research Foundation that have contributed so much to understanding of caves like this. Yet, for many years now, the Buffalo National River has prohibited recreational access to Fitton and many other caves, in an effort to protect bat populations from white-nose syndrome. This closure remains in place in 2025, despite white-nose long since becoming established across the region, and has become increasingly controversial. If that topic interests you, this thoughtful Arkansas Times article is well worth a read, and we'll link to it below. So, here in Cecil Cove, we have a stream network at the surface, and a car system below ground. Both change over time, cutting ever deeper into the landscape. It's a fun mental challenge to try and envision the interactions between these components over time. For example, were more of these karst features connected into a single system before valley erosion separated them? The karst conduits clearly affect water flow in the basin. Many segments of Cecil Creek and the tributaries are dry most of the time, classic examples of losing stream segments whose water has been diverted into the karst. And imagine the consequences of large floods on creekside cave entrances like this one. Under what conditions do creek sediments enter the cave network? Now take questions like these and place them in the context of the last few million years. Glaciers never came closer than central Missouri, but their broader effects certainly influenced northern Arkansas. How did the landscape and the cave systems respond to Ice Age Pleistocene climate cycles? As a final chapter, our naturalist sides couldn't help but make biological observations while exploring Cecil Cove and the surrounding area, and we ran across a number of interesting connections to the Pleistocene. This large print made us think of the saber-toothed cats that once lived here. Maybe black bears and mountain lions aren't so bad after all. Feral hog wallows are disturbing, but bones of Pleistocene peccaries have been recovered in multiple Ozark locations. How much ground did they dig up? Invasive plants like wineberry are rapidly creating impenetrable thickets, even in remote locations, but are also a reminder that vegetative communities aren't fixed on a geologic timescale. For example, small patches of sphagnum moss appear on sandstone ledges within the modern Buffalo River region. These plants bring to mind northern peat bogs. Are they minor holdouts from a very different Pleistocene ecosystem? And while beavers are rare in the modern Ozarks, they were once prolific, and these critters are definitely ecosystem engineers. Could once extensive beaver dams have affected the interaction between surface water and cave systems? Whether or not we ever have the opportunity to go in Fitton Cave, we're delighted by the science coming out of it. The 2025 research paper that prompted this visit and video studied the age of various sediment layers deposited in Fitton Cave over the last two million years and dated various cave formations. It came to some fascinating conclusions about the Ice Age and Ozarks, yet left other questions tantalizingly unanswered. Now that we've established the geologic context for Fitton Cave, we'll discuss the study itself in a follow-up video. In the meantime, if you're fortunate enough to visit Cecil Cove, please enjoy its many geologic wonders, respectfully and safely.